protein is complex because we have 20 amino acids that we have all the time. One of the, the lines I like to use a lot is saying we have a protein requirement is like saying we have a requirement for a vitamin pill. We don't actually need the pill, we need the 12 vitamins that are in it. And for protein, we don't actually need protein, we need the nine essential amino acids that are in it. And particularly lysine, methionine, tryptophan, and leucine are always limiting in plant-based proteins. As you look at plants, certain kinds of plants are more limiting in individual amino acids. So grains in general, wheat and oat, corn are all very limiting in lysine. Uh, legumes like soy and pea are limiting in methionine, the sulfur amino acids. And if you think about protein, protein is consumed in meals. Uh, if you look at mTOR signaling, mTOR is stimulated by a number of things. One of them is protein, leucine, but it's also stimulated by insulin, IGF-1, uh, energy, carbohydrates in particular, uh, and some other things. And so the problem with it is they're ignoring the fact that the animals are overeating too many calories. They're eating chronically 24 hours a day. They have too much insulin. And so they chose to blame protein when in fact it's always an insulin carbohydrate problem. And the issue uh, with protein is we need to eat it in pulses. We want mTOR to trigger and then we want it to go into an idle phase. Uh, the worst thing you can do is graze all day long and keep mTOR active all day long. Um, anyway, so mTOR has lots of different roles in every different tissue, but in muscle it has a very unique role in terms of, especially in adults, in terms of how we maintain our muscle mass. And it's critical to understand how to, how to keep that balance correctly. What's interesting in amino acids though is while the meal is digested and absorbed, amino acids will pool in the blood and in the free pools for up to like five hours. And so after a meal, you'll have elevated blood levels for a fairly extensive period of time. What's interesting within that is that muscle protein synthesis will only last about two to two and a half hours. So while your meal is still being absorbed, um, and you still have high blood levels, you're actually not getting a lot of benefit to it. So while you're consuming uh, a lot of your calories with the meat for lots of different reasons, as far as a muscle effect, you're way over consuming the amount of protein that you're getting a muscle benefit from. I mean, there's calorie balance and all kinds of things that you can choose to do it for, but one of the things I like to talk about is that there's a range of meal response. And depending on the exact protein you're using, that's probably somewhere between 25 with a really high absorbing protein like whey, up to maybe 55 grams of protein. Beyond that, you're probably not getting much of a muscle effect. So you may get whole body effects. Uh, you may have a larger liver or a larger kidney or a larger GI tract but you can't make muscles larger just by having larger meals. And the two meals that are most critical are your first meal after an overnight fast and probably your last meal, a dinner meal, because they're farthest apart. No one to my knowledge has ever shown a leucine response to a lunch meal. So basically, I, you know, I look at meal distribution as I want to have a first meal and, and then the response range I talked about a little bit ago was 25 to, to 55 grams, somewhere in that range. So for me personally, I want that first meal to be in the upper part of that range. So I'm having 45, 50 grams of protein, not quite a pound and a half of meat, but I'm having a fairly high protein meal and I have the last one. The middle meal, I'm kind of in weight maintenance. I'm not really looking to gain muscle mass. I kind of don't pay that much attention to my noon meal. And you know, other meals, I, I look at meal sequences. If you're kind of an adult, happy with your body composition and weight, two meals a day is perfectly fine for protein. If you're in a catabolic condition like weight loss or you're trying to change your body composition, I think three meals a day is a better choice because you have more anabolic periods. And if you're in a, an anabolic period like you want to build muscle, then I think four periods per day 
but you get only about two and a half hours per meal. And so how many of those do you want per day? <laughs> First and foremost, if you're going to build muscle, you have to have the resistance training. So you have to have the, the dynamic need to increase your mild fibers content. Uh, as far as the nutritional support for it, I think you captured it exactly right. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you have to think about these leucine thresholds. You have to stimulate mTOR. We know that muscle protein synthesis is always running, maybe 35, 40%. But what leucine does is trigger the extra capacity. It triggers certain mRNAs to express and it's the ones that actually increase your capacity to build myofibular proteins. So it's targeting certain mRNAs. Uh, so it's not like you're going from zero to something. You're going from 40% to 100% max is what's, what's happening. And that can be sustained for about two and a half hours. We don't really know why, but there's pretty much agreement that a meal will only run so long. And what's interesting about that is the mTOR signal is still probably active five hours later, but protein synthesis has pretty much shut back down after two and a half hours. Uh, once you get out of growth, once you get past your mid-20s, now it's diet quality. So insulin takes on a passive role. Um, having some carbohydrate with the meal is probably okay, but you'll actually get enough of an insulin response just with the branch chain amino acids. So you can get an anabolic response pretty much just with protein, as long as you have enough calories in the meal to also make it, uh, you know, an anabolic period. One of the great things about protein and gluconeogenesis is it's very slow compared to the effect of eating carbohydrates. I mean, carbohydrates, when you eat a meal that contains carbohydrates, that will enter the blood and has to be cleared in two hours, or that's the definition of diabetes. If you're not back to baseline within two hours, uh, that's diagnostic for diabetes. It's a toxic substance. Uh, where amino acids, they will pool, as I said earlier, in the blood for at least five or more hours. And so you're going to be slowly converting that carbon into glucose or fatty acids, ketogenic, uh, over at least a five, six hour period. And so it's a very slow process and very continuous. When you have a high protein, low carbohydrate diet, you actually maintain higher blood glucose in the middle of the night. You don't go into those hypoglycemic states where you wake up starving because you're actually using amino acids to continuously make uh, glucose. And the body sort of adapts to that. The thing to always remember is that glucose is a highly toxic substance in the body. It's an interesting thing in that it's an essential fuel for brain, neurons, red blood cells, but it's also one of the most toxic substances the body experiences. And so it's very tightly controlled. But if you have elevated blood glucose, it shuts down metabolism of everything else. First and foremost, you have to get glucose under check. And when you do that, you stop fatty acid oxidation and you stop branch chain amino acid oxidation. And so you'll get a build up of free fatty acids and branch chain amino acids in the blood, but is secondary to the excess glucose. You bring glucose intake back down and you'll correct both of those other issues. The way we actually discovered leucine and the branch chain amino acids was actually we were doing a carbohydrate study. We were actually doing it for um, Gatorade. And what we found is at the end of these elite cycle power studies um, was that the branch chain amino acid in the blood dropped like a rock. And we thought, what in the world does that do? And so we then looked at protein synthesis and saw it fell off after these exhaustive exercises. And that's where the whole concept of leucine supplementation and mTOR and EIF4 came from. There have been great reviews. There's one by Stu Phillips. There's been two or three in the last three years. Uh, and they overwhelmingly show that protein does not cause kidney problems. In fact, all of the direct studies show that kidney actually enhances renal function. It enhances the glomerular filtration rate, the rate of clearance. It makes the kidney more efficient. It's kind of like saying, you know, it, you shouldn't exercise because it makes your heart work harder. Uh, you know, protein makes your kidney more functional.
Uh, protein in general requires more fluid. Um, one of the things we always saw in our weight loss studies, uh, particularly with women, is we would take them from fairly low protein diets to higher, and they would often <clears throat> experience constipation in the first week or so. And that's really a dehydration issue. The, the protein just uh, is os hyperosmotic. It will draw water to it. Uh, and, it, you know, you just have to be conscious that you're going to need more fluids to go with it. I mean, kidney, liver, GI tract are all very efficient in handling protein. But what you have to realize is it might require an adaptation period. So if you go from somebody who's consuming 60 or 70 grams per day and you want to get them up to 150, you should do that over a week to two week period because all of those enzymes, all of those things have to adapt. So if you just take a person who's eating 60 and you give them 150 grams, there's a good chance you're going to see some ammonia in the blood or you're going to see some diarrhea. You're going to see problems because it just takes the body time to adapt all of those digestive enzymes and the liver enzymes for the urea cycle and the kidney extract. All of those things have to adapt to the new normal. The thermic effect of protein uh, is somewhere around 15 to 20 percent of calories will be wasted uh, as energy, where with carbohydrate and fat, it's around 5 percent. So there's a real there's a real difference in a thermic effect, and not to even mention the satiety effect is higher than carbohydrate. So from a calorie control standpoint, substituting protein for carbohydrate is always a huge benefit in terms of calorie control. Having all of your protein in a single large meal will have less thermic effect than having it in multiple meals that reach these thresholds. So again, you know, I think distribution is important, but we have to understand that the distribution isn't based just on making it distributed evenly. It's based on how many times are you reaching these leucine thresholds of three grams or more. I mean, that's the key. You know, what we found in others is that if you give a protein meal, you'll run muscle protein synthesis for about two, two and a half hours. Uh, and then it's kind of refractory for a simulation. If just giving more protein on top of it doesn't really seem to make much difference. And so we always recommend that for the efficiency, you should space your protein meals at least four to five hours apart because that allows for all of the mechanisms to reset, the ATP to come back into balance, and you can sort of redo it again. For example, we know that mTOR requires somewhere around three grams to really stimulate mTOR, three grams of leucine. Um, and so if, for example, you're having a small meal, like a lunch meal that only has 15 grams of protein and might only have 1.5 grams of leucine, if you put in another 1.5 grams of leucine, you can make that meal act like it's 30 grams of protein. So supplementing one in a small meal, and in that case, I would always supplement all three branch chains. You should probably never just supplement leucine alone. You should probably always supplement all three of them because they metabolize together. You know, you need to be up in the 1.6 grams per kg of protein, and that's kind of high for a lot of the keto diet. So uh, I've not seen any particular data that makes me believe that keto diets are more sparing than, you know, a more protein-centric thinking about. Uh, on higher protein diets, you tend to see more urinary calcium. And so people jump to the idea that the, the acidity was causing bone loss. But when people like Kerstetter and others uh, looked at it, what they found was that protein greatly increases calcium absorption. So you're going from calcium absorption of around 20% of dietary calcium to over 40%. And so you just have to excrete more in the urine because you've got more than you can use. All of the data from any of the fracture data, any of the sort of acute bone changes all show that higher protein diets are beneficial. Uh, what people sort of mistake is they sort of think, well, bone is a mineral thing. Well, bone is really a protein thing. It's a protein matrix that has to be formed first. And then what we do is deposit minerals on top of that matrix to give it structure or, or give it rigidity. 
Uh, but protein or muscle, I'm sorry, bone first and foremost is a protein structure. And just like muscle protein turnover, bone has a protein turnover and we have to support it. So I think sarcopenia and osteoporosis are the same disease. They're basically lack of resistance exercise and lack of protein. They're not lack of calcium. I saw some data just last week about uh, of young women in the United States with all this plant-based discussion that 20% of women in the 16 to 26 range, range are below the EAR. They're below 0.66 grams per kg. So those are frank deficiency symptoms. And 20% of women in the United States. I mean, that's kind of a frightening number. It's not about an even distribution at all. It's about how many meals per day do you want to hit these leucine thresholds? And I personally like a rather uneven distribution. I would, I personally try and get 45 grams in breakfast. My lunch might be 20. My dinner might be 65. Uh, you know, so I'm up and down. I like to push the upper limit of protein at a meal, and I like to have a high level in my first meal, and I kind of like having a meal that's a little lower. I like it being variable, but I'm getting at least two meals per day that are greatly exceeding that leucine threshold. For most adults, I would like to see it in the 1.2 to 1.6. For endurance athletes, uh, sort of in that more 1.6 kind of range, and strength athletes, 1.6 to 2.2. I think those are totally normal ranges for, for those kinds of individuals. My university email is simply dlayman at illinois.edu.